welcome to Dignified Resilience. My today's guest is one of the most optimistic humans I know, and I'm happy to call him a friend as well. One from whom I learn and I always gladly suck out that positive energy that he's always radiated. But I do always add and I say, but chick, what about this? But chick, what about this? And he always finds a way to reassure me that yes, things can be worse, like I tend to believe, or that things could be better the way that he always wants to believe. He also does have a lot of experience to back it all up though. My today's guest, Chick Dumba, has had a very prolific career and I'm so happy and honored, and as I said at the beginning of this podcast, to um, host a variety of people from all sorts of backgrounds and ages and industries that they've come from. Chick, um, his prolific career includes I mean, he was the president of the Alliance for Peace Building, which, by the way, recently has named number one global peace building influencer and change agent among peace building institutions worldwide. He was also the president of the National Peace Corps Association. Together with the activist icon Peter Yarrow, he also led the Operation Respect Program to transform schools, camps, and other youth organizations into safer, more respectful, and bully-free environments. Although he is now, I believe, retired, and he'll tell us more about it, he's also been an adjunct faculty member at Johns Hopkins University. He tirelessly worked for peace, justice, and human rights around the world, and he was even nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 by some members of Congress. I will add that he's also now uh, chairman of the Mali Affinity Group, and he serves on the governing boards of the Institute for Economics and Peace, the International Peace and Security Institute, Future Symphony, the Citalit Project, and so much more that I even didn't know and just found out while researching his biography of fish. Um, okay. So we will speak about all of it. Oh, and of course, he was a national champion kayak racer and served as an official for canoe and kayak competition in the 1988, 92, and 96 Olympic Games. So we'll speak about all of that and his many private battles that he had to deal with throughout uh, building such a prolific and diverse career, all of which he included in his book memoir, Exhaust the Limits, the new edition, which um, came out a few months ago. And on top of that, as if it needs more, uh, I think Chick is one of the kindest, most decent human beings that I have met, who has helped me and my family in few instances that we needed it the most, as trivial and as huge as they seemed um, to us in that moment. So thank you, Chick. Um, it is my honor to finally have you here in Dignified Resilience. And the first question besides saying welcome is, uh, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? <laughs> well, listening to that introduction, I'm feeling awfully good. <laughs> I wish my mother were alive to hear it. <laughs> that was awfully kind of you. And uh, I, I cherish our friendship. Uh, I'm doing fine, uh, all things considered, still optimistic, but, uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic uh, and, and recognizing that while we have our family struggles, I compare us with so many other people here in the U.S. and all over the world and just say, oh my God, we're, we're so lucky ourselves and uh, just empathize with those that are, are really, really struggling. And of course, especially those who have lost family members. I mean, this is just truly out, out, extraordinary that we're having to deal with this. But as for me, I'm doing fine. Thank you. That's great to hear, Chick. Um, and yeah, thank you for mentioning. Absolutely. I don't think we speak enough in, uh, about the humane aspect of, well, even the number of people who died, not just the statistics, but in terms of the lives lost, right? Throughout this yeah. time. Yeah. And they're real lives. These, are, these aren't numbers. These are human beings. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I put my mask on to protect myself. <laughs> Me too. We're, we're getting good at wearing a mask. <laughs> um, so let's get to the book. Um, you also have this very nice drawing by Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Matt Worker, uh, as yes. well, which is really um, nice. So in your book, you write in the first couple of pages, um, and I quote, i read it. My life and career have careened from one passion and cause to another, but my commitment to peace has been constant and consistent. 
I can't stand the notion that some human beings believe their nations, tribes, gangs, or congregations have a right or obligation to kill and destroy others in order to advance their cause, ideology, faith, or economic interests. Violent force never determines who is right or wrong. It only proves that one side can inflict and endure more pain and suffering than the other. I know mankind has always done it, but that doesn't make it right, reasonable, or acceptable. Wow, that was so cool. <laughs> can we expand this thought a little bit, please, based on all your career and everything um, that, that, that you've just gained throughout all these years? Well, happy to, but I think in, you know, I really worked on that language in the book, and, and that kind of expresses the, the core value that, that I've tried to live by and, and promote. Uh, it just, to me, makes absolutely no sense that anyone, anywhere, for any cause, would resort to the use of violent force. It has nothing to do with whether you're right or wrong. It just indicates that you can, you can beat somebody else and you get your way in our normal society. Of course not. You know, in our in our households, if, if our kids get into a fight, we give them hand grenades to settle it. Of course not. It would be stupid. And and in our neighborhoods, you know, if we get into, into a dispute with our neighbors, we put landmines along the border between our houses because we're mad at each other. Of course not. It would be stupid. And in the business world, the corporations drop bombs on each other and they're competing for business. Of course not. It would be stupid. So why is it that in any other realm of human existence, we not only tolerate, we even honor the use of violent force to advance one cause or another? I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, so uh, I, I try to express that to the people that I meet with. And of course, they say, well, you, you naive fool, people have always done it that way and they always will. And I say, well, the, there are a whole lot of things that have been done throughout history that we just don't do anymore. Slavery being among them. We, we always did slavery. Well, it's not acceptable anymore. I'm sorry. And you could go through a whole litany of things that, that used to be common practices that just are no longer acceptable. And I hope we can move to the point where it's recognized that the use of violent force is simply no longer acceptable. And we're putting in place the systems and the institutions to provide an alternative way to resolve our differences without taking up arms. So I, I believe in that, and, and, and we are making some progress. And so part of my mission in life is to do what I can to advance that concept. Which leads me perfectly to my next question, which was, could we talk a little bit about the title of your book and the inspiration? from, you know, essays on the myth of Sisyphus, I, I believe. So um, I didn't think about it when I just saw Exhaust the Limits. It just kind of made sense knowing you. But then, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Tell us yeah. more about it. Well, sure. There, there are two elements to that. One of them is the myth of Sisyphus, and the other is Exhaust the Limits, all contained in this remarkable book by Albert Camus, one of my favorite writers and philosophers. Uh, exhaust the Limits comes from the, uh, the Greek poet Pindar, who said, Oh, my soul, do not aspire to immortal life, but exhaust the limits of the possible. And Camus starts off is his book on, the, on Sisyphus, quoting Pindar saying that. And I read that back when I was in college. That's what you do in college. You read books like that, <laughs> and you're shaping your values. And I came, ran across that and said, Yeah, that makes sense. You know, you've, you've got one crack at this life. Give it everything you got. Make the most of it and enjoy it as best you can and make as much positive difference as you can. So when I came to write the memoir, I was kind of thinking through, you know, what, what values has kind of driven me to do these things? And I thought back on that and said, yeah, exhaust the limits. That, that's what it's all about. And the other is, is Sisyphus and the story of Sisyphus. And as, as we know from our, our, uh, our Greek history, that uh, Sisyphus was condemned by the god Zeus to push a rock up a hill only to have it roll back down to the bottom, and that had always been interpreted as perdition, as that was one of the worst things that could happen to you, the futility of pushing that rock up a hill only to have it roll back down. And Camus looked at that and said, well, that's life. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the human condition. We push a rock up a hill and it rolls back down. And at the end of our days, it rolls back down to the bottom and stays there. <laughs> but, but in the meantime, in the meantime, we've got a rock 
we've got something we can do. And as long as we have that rock, something of value that, that's our reason to exist, as long as we are pushing that rock, there is meaning, there's value, there's joy. And I, I took that and kind of internalized it. And I've certainly pushed a lot of rocks. And I've had a whole lot of them roll back down to the bottom of the hill. And I go back down to the bottom of the hill and say, okay, let's try again. Let's see if we can get a little bit higher. And when it comes to trying to make the world more peaceful, we are getting the rock a little bit higher on the hill. The world is more peaceful than it used to be. And that's because there are a whole lot of people who say, let's see what we can do reduce the frequency and severity of violent conflict but well, let's make that happen and uh, you know we haven't reached nirvana yet certainly won't within my lifetime but we're making progress thank you uh, <laughs> my next question is uh, related to another part of your book where you write that you're a 60s activist and proud of it you you wrote in the book saying I quote, my antipathy toward the war in Vietnam grew by the day. But then you also added, opposing the war in Vietnam was easy at Wisconsin, Berkeley, and Columbia. On those campuses, protest was the norm to which everyone was expected to conform. OSU was a very different matter. And OSU is the college where you went in Oklahoma, right? At uh, State University there. So would you want to share anything from that period in general or some lasting lessons or memories that might even be pertinent today? Sure, ha happy to. Uh, those, those are remain, even though it was 50 years ago, those remain powerful, powerful memories. And my friendships from then, the, the group of us that were, were activists together, we're still in touch with each other. We get together. Uh, and, and, and we really care deeply about one another. But yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the 60s were a period of, of turmoil and activism on the civil rights issues, on freedom of speech, and on the war in Vietnam, and eventually uh, getting into the environment. And you know, we had come out of the period of the 50s where, where everything was pretty tranquil and everybody just kind of thought everything is fine, but lurking beneath the surface were several very troubling elements racism being among them uh, in the African-American community had the temerity to call our attention to it and say, wait a second, you claim all human beings are equal? No, we're not. We're not treated the same. And they started to call our attention to it. And some of us responded to that and said, well, you know, you're right. We've got to do something about that. And there's a, a part of my book where I talk about a, a, a dear friend of mine. I, I played football at Oklahoma State and one of my teammates, an African-American, was traumatized, was brutalized. And, and that, that sensitized me to what was going on. Well, with regard to the war, you know, when, when we started fighting the war in Vietnam, and I was, I was of the right age to join the military and go fight, and I was ready to drop out of school and join the Marines and go kill the commies. But I was, I, after I left the football team, I joined the debate team, which is not a normal path for people, but, but I, I did that. And the debate team looked into the war in Vietnam, and we did some research on it and found out that it was a colossal, colossal mistake. And, and, and the, the information was there, just nobody dared to look at it and talk about it. We found it and started talking about it, said, well, this is a colossal mistake. I'm certainly not going to go put on a uniform and kill people over a mistake. And I certainly don't want to get killed myself. And I've got to speak out about it and help people understand it. So I became part of the anti-war movement. And, but at Oklahoma State, which is known as the Cowboys. It's a cowboy school, very, very, very conservative. And to speak out against the war at Oklahoma State was not easy. In fact, we were spat upon and uh, the administration tried to run us out of school and they didn't appreciate us one bit, but we were persistent. We stayed with it year after year and built up support for our position. So uh, by 1969, a couple of years into this effort, we had built so much support on the campus that we, we staged a big rally and it, we, it got so much support from the faculty and the students that the university administration just shut down the university and said, you've got too much support. Nobody's gonna go to their classes. Go ahead and have your rally. And a US Senator by the name of Fred Harris, who had always supported the war and who I had gotten to know, I had the privilege as a college student to get to know this US Senator, we became friends, but he had always supported the war. And I would have said, you know, Senator Harris, please reconsider your position on the war. And he came to that rally in 1969 and announced that he had changed his mind. 
that he was going to oppose the war. And it became big headlines, huge story. I had the privilege of introducing him that day to, to give that speech, and it just means so much. And a couple of years ago, by the way, we had a reunion of our group, and the senator came to our reunion and celebrated with us. And to this day, the university now has photographs of what we did on the hall in their alumni center, proudly, proudly showing what we were doing back then, even though they were trying to kick us out of school back then. So it was quite an intense time. That's amazing. And I mean, I, you really nicely kind of summed up a tremendous amount of changes that were happening or you, you write in your book um, on page 44, the 60s began in tranquility, but they ended in turmoil. The serenity masked a nation that practiced effort hate, restricted basic freedoms, ignored a rapidly deteriorating ecosystem, and blindly followed national leaders regardless of their merit. America began the decade with a low grade, but expanding intrusion into the internal affairs of a small Southeast Asian nation 10,000 miles away. The decade ended with unspeakable death and destruction, and the nation's innocence was in shreds. The turbulence we generated helped expose the sins and enforced changes in policies and behavior. That's uh, that's really that's really I, I I found that paragraph very powerful and um, kind of you what you said in terms of the changes that you helped create um, were very important. You know, we start to think about the big changes, but even when we start from changes in our local community, mm -hmm. that really matters um, a lot in terms of the potential ripple effect that it can have afterwards, right? You um, bet. Absolutely. So then afterwards, uh, Chick, you ended up carrying a really prominent leadership role in Peace Corps. Um, you started in Colombia, which you're right was a life-changing experience. But then you also add that the experience in Colombia from the summer of 67 to the fall of 69 was transforming, but it took me out of the US during a dramatic period for politics and social change. Race riots burned inner city neighborhoods and challenged all pretense of domestic tranquility. You're right, demonstrations against the Vietnam War escalated in size and intensity. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and Robert Kennedy met the same fate. Wow, so, so much. Um, how do those days seem from today's perspective? Like how does today also seem from the perspective of someone who those days too? Well, good question. And a lot of people are comparing what's going on today with what went on in the 60s. And I, I think rightfully so. Uh, some of the issues are the same. Certainly the racial issues are the same as they were back then. We've made a lot of progress from what life was like back then. And John Lewis, before he passed away, you know, reminded people of the progress that we have made, where we've not achieved everything that we need to achieve, but at least, at least we've made progress. But, but that issue remains on the table, remains unresolved, and we still have a lot of work to do on it. But the, the, I think the fact that we were able to come out of that period of the 60s and regain some semblance of collegiality within our society gives me reason to believe that we can do it yet again. Uh, I, I know these are tough times. Uh, people are pretty mad at each other um, and, and have, have a hard time talking with each other. Uh, we, we did back then too, but uh, we worked our way through it and I think we will again this time. Uh, I, I'm concerned about what's going on, very concerned. Uh, I'm worried about our democracy here in the US and around the world. You see these autocrats emerging around the world and the United States should be the leading nation for democracy and for human rights and we're not. It just troubles me deeply that we are not playing the role in the world that we should be, that we've done year after year, decade after decade, and here we are on the wrong side of these issues today. But I, but I still believe <laughs> that, uh, that, that we'll, we'll get it straightened out, that we'll get back on the right side, and that most of the rest of the world community will recognize the, the, the dreadful life that, that comes when uh, under autocratic rule uh, and that we'll, we'll return to a sense of democracy and respect for human rights and for collegiality for bringing the world together. We spent the last 75 years putting in place systems and structures and institutions to facilitate the capacity for human beings all over the world 
to communicate with one another and find collegial ways to resolve our differences. 75 years of putting that all in place, and now we see efforts by our own leaders to destroy all of that. And say, why? Why, why, why? It's made the world so much better for us here in the U.S. and for everybody else. Why would you want to tear those things down? So, yes, there is an effort to tear those things down, but I believe the institutions are strong enough. They, I think there's a good, enough goodwill here in the U.S. and around the world to come to our senses and go back to uh, rebuilding and strengthening those systems and structures and institutions and building an attitude that we share this planet together. We're all human beings on this planet, and we need to find ways to work together for the, to improve the quality of life of everyone. So I'm still an optimist. That does, though, lead me to a question, which you kind of address, I guess, in terms of the explanation of your views. You write that uh, when you describe your experiences from Peace Corps and how it helped you gain a whole new set of values and global perspectives, you use John Stuart Mill. And um, you say, I mean, Mill said, human nature is rich and complex. The good life can be lived in several different ways, and each profits from dialogue with the rest. So... You've written, I mean, you, you, you write, I've lived a rich life because of the never ending dialogue with the rest of humanity, of the humanity, and none have meant more than my friends and neighbors in the barrios of Cartagena. So, can you share some of the comments? You know what, before you actually go on, when I was reading your paragraph, do you know what I thought of? I thought of the Quran. The way that you use Mill's quotes to kind of talk about never-ending dialogue with the rest of humanity, it reminded me of one surah, uh, 49th surah from the Quran, which is the holy book of Muslims, and I am a Muslim. And the 13th uh, verse from then, Al-Hujurat, the surah, um, which, which says, O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes, then you may know one another. So getting to know one another. I mean, the, even for me, I mean, I kind of, when I was reading you talking about the way that you've gone out to the world and what led you to the curiosity, but also that dialogue that you've entered with. And I was reading um, it and it, it kind of rang the bell of something that personally inspires me in terms of always being willing to get into that dialogue because we do have different experiences. We do come from different backgrounds, but it is, for me, kind of that idea that we need to get to know each other and hopefully to compete in good as you know God, God tells us and I get inspired by. Uh, but regardless of whether it's a religious you know, mantra or a holy verse from some book or John Stuart Mill, I wanted to say that I was uh, really agreeing with what you said about this idea of meeting other people um, and getting into dialogue with them. So I'm just curious about any of your additional comments to what you wrote, uh, not just necessarily about that, you know, Peace Corps experience that has helped you, but also if you want to expand either on that or in general. Well, white Americans like me are boring. All right, we're boring. And if all I did is hang out with people like me, I would lead a very, very boring life. But I get to meet people like you from a very different part of the world and with a totally different faith background than what I have. And that enriches me. I'm a richer man because I know you. And I know my friend Victor Ochen from, you, from Uganda. Uh, I know my, my friends from Colombia where I served in the Peace Corps. Uh, my, my friends from various Asian countries. That makes me a wealthy man because I have the privilege of interacting with all of these fascinating, wonderful, wonderful people. And one of the things that, I, that I've done that I think a lot of people would say, how can you do that, is just be open to meet people on airplanes and in airports <laughs> and, and in taxi cabs and in, in restaurants. You and I met at LaGuardia Airport in line to get on a bus to go to Penn Station. Yeah, that's right. I was a right. back from a vacation in Bosnia and I was probably heading up uh, to train to go upstate uh, to Hamilton College where I studied. And uh, it's, a, it's a great story. It's the only time, Chick, the first and the only time that I got into a cab with a stranger. 
but uh, it was very serendipitous and I was very uh, lucky and I was in a very big hurry. And um, I guess my instinct was, was right and I'm so glad that that happened because of everything that ensued in terms of our friendship. But it's one of those crazy stories, at least for me, maybe you do it all the time. <laughs> I don't. So it was, you know, it was crazy to, for me to think about it. But um, yes, it's, uh, that's how we met and that's, uh, it's just great, one of those but g give me a choice between finding a pot of gold at LaGuardia Airport that day and meeting you. God, I, I, I would choose meeting you. I could say that. Far more valuable, far more valuable to have met you and have this enduring friendship. Absolutely. I'm so grateful for it. So, Chick, you have spent big chunks of your life engaged with various sports as well, uh, from kayak racing to running, including eight marathons you ran, I believe, including yep. twice and New York twice. You even had this, what you write, and I never knew until I read it, five ring fever, because you <laughs> had an unrealistic ambition to be an Olympic. But I wanted to ask you, what role has sports played in your life in terms of, I mean, you've been so engaged with it, and you've been so curious, and you try different things. What did you learn from it as well? I mean, you, you well, were, and wherever you went, whatever you did, it was not just sports. I was so amazed that to read the details, the intricate details that you describe, including how you even played a part in changing some appalling racist practices when you were chairman of the governing board of that Guilford Wildlife Club, as mm -hmm. I remember, when the name of one of the candidates to be approved for club yep. member was read with an immediate no as an answer, and you only realized after a while why that was happening, right? So even when yep. There were so many intricacies that, that I learned, which were so um, great reminders, actually, about the dynamics that happen within the sports organizations as well. Sure. But tell us more about your, the role that sports has played in your life. Well, sports has been an important part of my life. I, I grew up being involved with athletics. My whole family was in athletics. My brother was a cross-country runner. My father was a, was a track star at, at Ohio State University, and, and I played football and, and other sports in high school and got a scholarship to uh, play football at Oklahoma State. So it was an important part of my life. Uh, and, and I did it because I enjoyed it and enjoyed the, the collegiality of, of uh, the people that I trained with and, and competed with. There's something special to that, that, uh, that fraternity of the people that do that. But along the way, there's some really, really important lessons, particularly with regard to race relations. Several of my strongest experiences with regard to race relations related to my athletic career. Uh, first of all, at Oklahoma State, I became friends with one of my teammates, a guy named Earl Jones, who the, 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 who got hurt, and the coaches wanted to force him to quit so that they, he would lose his scholarship. Uh, I also got hurt, but they didn't try to force me off the team, but Earl was black. They tried to force him off the team, and what they did to him was horrific. I mean, brutal, 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 brutal. And finally, they ran him off the team, and it was it was tragic. Uh, and I result, result, resolved from that because I didn't do anything at the time. I felt so guilty. For decades, I felt guilty that I did nothing to help my friend Earl as part of what got me involved in, in social action. Uh, so I had that, and, and then, as you indicate, years later, I was using a place in Greensboro, North Carolina, Lake Jeanette, in the Guilford Wildlife Club that had this nice piece of property and this nice lake that I used to, to train in my kayak. Uh, but they asked me to become chairman of the board of the organization, and it's mostly a fishing club, so why they wanted me on the board, I don't know, but they did. So I was chairman of the board. And this was a membership organization, and the board had to vote people in to membership. And one of the meetings, uh, somebody was passing around some literature, and I asked what it was, and they said, well, you don't need to know about it. Said, well, I'm just kind of curious. But it was about carp, the fish carp. And the story in it was that if you let carp into your pond, it will ruin the pond. Oh. And I thought, well, gee, do we have a problem with carp in Lake Jeanette? And we all know. Turns out that a black man had applied to become a member of the club, and CARP was a euphemism for black man, and when it came time to vote on whether or not he could become a member of the club, 
They simply said carp. And when I heard that, I thought, wait a second, I know what they're talking about. And I refused. I forced them to acknowledge what, what they were talking about was race and said, if you refuse this man membership in this club, I will resign right now and I will go straight to the newspapers and the television stations and let them know that this is a racist organization. And they acknowledged that they didn't dare let that happen, so they let this guy into the club. But it's one of several things that have happened in my sporting life that has also coincided with, with a set of values with regard to human rights and humanitarian causes. Your relationship with Earl, though, did not end with all those instances at OCU, right? Nope. You want to tell uh, us about Yeah, it? sure, sure. This is one of the most meaningful things that has ever happened to me. Uh, Earl was forced to leave the team. The last I saw of him was him literally crawling, crawling off the practice field in the fall of 1965. And I worried about him and had wanted to find him ever since. Mm -hmm. 40 years later, I was writing my memoir and I was writing that story and wondering where he was. And I got an email from Earl Jones. He found me. And pardon me, I get emotional about this. He found me. And I called him immediately with tears in my eyes. I say, Earl, I've been trying to find you. And I just finished writing this story about you. And, I, and then I said, would you mind if I, if I share it with you? So I want to make sure I got it right. And he said, by all means. I sent it to him. And he said, you got it exactly right. That, that's what happened. But I also said, I don't want to recall terrible memories for, for you. And he wrote back and he said, don't worry. He said, I've been sleeping like a baby because you acknowledged what happened to me. He said, he'd been through therapy, said, but what changed his life and helped him get over it and get over his nightmares was that I acknowledged 40 years later, 40 years later, what had happened to him. And we just became incredibly bonded as, as, as brothers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that only lasted a few years because he got cancer and he passed away. I had the privilege of going to visit him in Ocala, Florida, about a month before he passed away. We spent a, a delightful week together. We just laughed, even though he was about to die. We laughed and carried on and just had the best time. And then he passed away and I had the privilege of arranging for and presiding at the uh, memorial service for him. Wow. wow. Pardon me, I get emotional about that story. I can understand that, Chick. Um, all I can say is I'm glad that you got a chance to talk to him and yeah. create good memories after all that has happened um, when the relationship was first forming. It was a very powerful story. I um, and I did want and I asked you, do you want to talk about it? And you said absolutely. So. Um, Rest, I, I hope, and I'm sure he is now resting in peace. Um, Wonderful man. I, I, very accomplished, by the way. He went on to have a very successful career as a computer in, engineer with Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's even been written up in some books about uh, remarkable African Americans and, and their achievements in life. And who knows what still happens today in similar light? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it still happens. Yeah, I mean, let's let's also mention, of course, that when we speak about sports in your life, you married, hey, uh, thanks to sports, uh, as you yeah. went during the Olympic Festival in Syracuse, and then uh, later married in Syracuse in 1983. And you too, I mean, you were selected by the International Canoe Federation as an official for the games in Barcelona in 92, if I recall. I don't know, did you go together then? I mean, tell us a little bit about, when I asked you about the place of sports in your life, and then I saw how you met Kay, who is wonderful, <laughs> so kind, and just always so like warm and hospitable um, every time that, that I meet her. She's just really, really great. Tell us, yeah, tell us about Kay, who is yeah. a, <laughs> but you did meet her at, uh, thanks to sports as well well that, that's the best thing about sports is i got to meet Kay. <laughs> uh Kay is amazing she is an, an incredibly wonderful human being outstanding athlete 
uh, and, and just a, a wonderful human being. And uh, we may get to talk a little bit about Kai and our our youngest son and what we've uh, been through with him and what, what she has done in that regard. But yeah, I, I, I had the opportunity to meet Kay at a race. It was kind of fun. Uh, this was a competition with teams from various regions of the country. And one of my teammates from the, uh, the, the uh, Mid-Atlantic region indicated that somebody in a yellow uniform liked me. And I kind of looked at the team in yellow uniform and said, I, and I saw this one and I thought, jeez, looks pretty good. I said, I hope that's it. And it was. <laughs> so uh, I started hanging out with her at the Olympic Festival. And she was living in Texas. I was in Washington. We had a long distance uh, romance. Uh, and even did that for a while while we were married. She was in Texas and I was here on the East Coast. But uh, we always made it work out. She's just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and that leads me, of course, I mean, beyond the professional work and all sorts of challenges that you've overcome together as a couple, uh, which you describe very vividly and candidly in your book, soon enough and unexpectedly, life got very complicated for you in personal ways, too. After Kay gave birth to your second child together, and though Kai seemed completely normal at birth, you write how you soon found out that he had been born without functioning kidneys which required many medicines and soon numerous surgeries and eventually needed kidney donation, which first he got from Kay and then later from his teacher, Leslie. Oh, uh, the first one was for me. Oh my God, how could I have forgot that? Yeah, hey. <laughs> wow, I, uh, what, what I wanted to say is that considering the name of the podcast is Dignified Resilience, I just wanted to ask you, would you share um, anything and as much as you wish about the challenges from those days i mean from financial to health related to professional to all sorts of bad news that i just learned that you got to hear at the same time at one point in your life and i was just wow i mean talking about resilience as well and uh how i mean wow and i mean I, and the support i mean you get the support and you you you, you describe uh, how Kay was just like a superhero. She did not separate from Kai. But tell us a little bit. Of course, it's difficult to put a span of so many events into like a couple of minutes. But kind of what you remember um, from that period and that set of turbulences that hit you at once. Yeah, it was a challenge to say the least. We talk about resilience that required resilience. But but on the other hand, you know, we really had no choice. We had to do what we did, and we simply recognized that immediately, and the whole family just rallied around instantly, instantly, and just said, we are going to make this work, and we're going to have a good outcome, regardless of what it takes. Um, our, our oldest son, Alex, from my from a previous marriage, but he's, he's a bit older than, than the other two uh, boys in our family. But the, the night after we knew that, that Kai had a total kidney failure, I, I'll never forget calling Alex and just, just to tell him what was going on. And his response instantly, I mean, instantly was, I'll give him one of mine. I'll give him a kidney. He didn't have to do that, but that was his immediate response. Grant, uh, the, the middle child, uh, you know, could have been jealous of all of the attention that Kai got over the years, you know, because you, you do that. You have to when one of them has such intense medical issues. Grant just loves and been 100% supportive of all of us and of Kai throughout this time. And uh, as my mother was getting older and was making out her will, she uh, s suggested putting in something for to help cover the medical expenses. We were just overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed with medical expenses. And she suggested, well, maybe I'll put something in there for, for Kai's medical expenses. My brother and sister, that meant less for my brother and sister. Their immediate response was, but of course, put more in. You're not putting enough in. That meant less for them, more for Kai. That was the attitude that my family had toward this. So it just illustrates that, that the entire family just did the right thing. It says, yeah, we'll pull together. We're going to get through this, and we're going to survive it. And the good news is that Kai is alive and well and thriving. He's living in Germany and doing quite well. He's on his third transplant. I gave him one when he was two. When it ceased to function at age four, Kay gave him one of hers. 
Uh, that one lasted about 20 years. And when that one failed, one of Kai's elementary school teachers knew about it, said, I want to be the donor. She perf proved to be a perfect match, perfect match. And she became the donor. So she's part of our family now too. Amazing. And you did write in the book, while most of that period was filled with worry, stress, and sleepless nights, our family grew closer and stronger, which is beautiful. Um, not all families grow close, closer through difficulties. Some break I, up. I'm aware. Some, some break up over it. We, we became stronger. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm all the more glad for it. So, Chick, you work for various organizations which, as you say, were deeply involved in bringing the global community closer, whether it was inside the U.S. or going to mend the relationships between Ethiopia and Eritrea, to try to help the war in the early 90s, then going to Rwanda later on, Taiwan. You're today still part of Mali Affinity Group. You describe your um, experience in serving as the president of the National Peace Corps Association as the very highest honor I could imagine. So though it would be long and difficult to go through all those memories in this one podcast episode, I was wondering if there is something that's, some, if you could share some thoughts or if, if you look at it all from a bird perspective, both in terms of your efforts or challenges or results that came out, you went to such diverse places, but you, what, what is, there's always been this one thing, right? One desire to make peace, right? Yep, 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 make a difference. And, and the difference I wanna make is to make the world more peaceful. And the, the privilege of a lifetime, is when I was given the opportunity to run the National Peace Corps Association, the organization of the people that have served in the Peace Corps. What higher honor in the entire world could anyone have than being the spokesperson for and leading the Peace Corps community? Wow. Even directing the agency itself is, it would, would be a wonderful thing, but the Peace Corps Association is the or organization for all the people that have ever served in the Peace Corps. And I got to be the leader of that organization for a few years. And we managed to, to strengthen the organization, get it on track, and, and to do some, some pretty re remarkable things. So, you know, I was, I was an athlete. I had hoped to win an Olympic medal someday. Uh, didn't come close. <laughs> uh, well, that was good, but not that good. But give me, given a choice between being an Olympic champion and running the National Peace Corps Association, that's not a close call. I would take running the National Peace Corps Association, of course, of course. So I had the privilege of doing that, and that then uh, led, led to opportunities to get involved with the Ethiopia-Eritrea border war to play a, a very significant role, uh, along with Congressman John Garamendi and others in a small team we put together to work with the leaders of those two countries and to help them come to a resolution that brought an end to that war. And ended up doing the same thing in the Congo with the leaders of the major rebel groups and President Kabila to help them find a way to bring an end to their civil war. There's still a lot of turbulence going on there, but the large scale civil war came to an end and we played a central role in helping them recognize the futility and the stupidity of continuing to fight and to, to uh, build a coalition government and, and bring an end to it. So the, the, the Peace Corps opened all of the, as a volunteer, created those opportunities for me and then the, running the National Peace Corps Association gave me the opportunity to to really bring to fruition everything I had ever uh, hoped for as an opportunity to really make a, a meaningful difference. And I was just lucky that I had the opportunity to step in and do it. Yeah, and while you kept doing all that amazing work, you also got sick and didn't even know it, uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, I got Lyme disease, right? which is a pretty awful thing to have, uh, but it's not easy to detect. So I went six months with it undiagnosed. And while it's in there undiagnosed, it's doing permanent damage to the neurological system. And so uh, uh, I have some permanent damage from the Lyme disease. Um, but uh, when I finally got it uh, under control, I was much, much more functional. But, but uh, it certainly made me a lot weaker for that. That was, what, uh, 25 years ago that that, that happened, 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago that I had that. And um, um, it certainly 
weakened me, but but certainly hasn't put me on the sidelines. So I'm still able to do things. Now we've got Parkinson's disease on top of that. So that, that's really uh, slowing me down a lot. I do want to say that when I read those parts, some that I really wasn't also aware of, both in terms of history, and I just kept reading it, and I was in, I was only in more awe of how you still kept doing so much good work so tenaciously afterwards. I mean, including the, the, the new episode that ensued in your professional life with the Alliance for International Conflict Prevention and Resolution 2005, which later changed its name, that you were a big part of, right? As a CEO, you changed to Alliance for Peace Building, which now, as I said, grew into one of the leading institutions in its branch. Um, it seems like as I kept reading your book, your work kept gradually evolving, but it was indeed always along the same set of convictions uh, that, that kept uh, leading you. And you've mentioned uh, some of them throughout this episode. I want to add, Chip, that I was so personally uh, pleased when it was very meaningful for me when I saw you write uh, towards the end of the book, the Muslims are not the problem, literally, as you write. And for me, it was very important the way that you also added a sentence, literally saying and writing, the atrocities carried out by Serbian Christians like Slobodan Milosevic and Radovan Karadzic against Muslims make Osama bin Laden seem moderate on pages 269 and 270 of your book. I mean, it's horrible that we have to even make this sort of comparisons in the world about, you know, who is worse or this and that. But I do want to say that the, it was, I thought, brave, though straightforward fact for me, but I thought it was very important the way that you put things in a perspective for somebody who might not think about it. The way that I always put things in a perspective for my personal experience is saying that, you know, in the Balkans, whether it's Kosovo or Bosnia and the horrors that have been going on in the 1990s. And unfortunately, even now from last Sundays when the, you know, elections in Montenegro happened and we have um, the opposition that won, but it's, a, it's an opposition that's very inspired by the Serbian ethno-nationalist ideology. Yep which resulted immediately in horrific threats uh, against Bosniaks and uh, Muslims who, who live in Montenegro with the same calls for even Srebrenica and the same sort of genocide and revenge against the Turks, as they call us, as the extreme Serbian extremists call us for, for, for centuries almost. So I do want to say that I, um, it meant a lot to me that you use this reference from the Balkans and from the Bosnian genocide, but in general that um, you try to kind of say to your readers that the way that uh, war on terror has been portrayed in the United States and the violence that occurs around the world is not simple. And when I say this, I acknowledge this in terms of not also being apologetic for some of the horror that happens and then committed in the name of, uh, you know, Islam. Uh, so, it's complicated. I appreciated how you added a very important nuance because there is so much prejudice against Muslims in the United States, in Europe, in a, even a different uh, way in, in terms of Western Europe. And then even what I just described in the Balkans, in Bosnia, even in Montenegro now, uh, and so on. So long story short, I appreciate it because these sort of things need to be said by brave people who need to stand up and show and vocalize the nuances, um, especially considering the rampant Islamophobia, which is so in vogue, unfortunately. So thank you, Chick. I think this is really meaningful uh, for, for anybody and everybody who reads your book, and, but for this to, to be kept said. Thank you. We, we need to remind people that, uh, that every religion throughout history has had its good elements and its not so good elements. Uh, you go back uh, the early to middle part of the last century, the worst violence on the planet was taking place in Christian Europe. Sorry, guys, but that's where most of the terrible, terrible violence in the world was taking place. Uh, so, you know, this notion that Islam is intrinsically violent and Christianity isn't. No, I'm sorry. Neither one is intrinsically violent. Neither is intrin intrinsically peaceful. It's what the people do with it that makes the difference. And uh, um, 
I'm friends with so many incredibly wonderful Muslims. At the top of the list is my friend Riyadh, of course, but, uh, but, but many, many others as well who are just among the finest people on the planet. People are just, and you know, you know what, what, one and a half billion Muslims on the planet? If, if they're intrinsically violent, that this must be an awfully violent place to be because one and a half billion violent people could, could stir up a whole lot of trouble. Well, they don't. They just know there is a tiny, tiny element that does some pretty awful stuff, tiny, tiny element of Christianity and, and of others that also do some awful stuff. Let's put it into the proper perspective and deal with the, the attitudes that, that per perpetrate the violence, not with the religion. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. I thank you for, for that saying that again. I did want to say something again that sounded smart in my mind two seconds ago, but I lost the train of thought. <laughs> um, I remember, I'll get back to it. All right. um, but um, Tell us about your involvement with uh, Steve Kille in terms of the Institute of, for Economics and Peace. They do some great stuff as well. Um, fun and important. Um, they basically expand and research data-based analysis of the dynamics of peace compared with violence. Yeah. They do something called Global Peace Index. But tell more uh, to our sure. listeners about this um, organization and what they do. Sure, H happy to. Uh, Steve Killalay is one of my favorite people. Steve is a high school dropout from Sydney, Australia, who was a surf bum and started playing around on computers and figured out how they work and became one of the world's leading computer technology uh, geniuses and, and successful entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and it's made gobs of money. <laughs> and uh, unlike some other people, he said, I don't need all of this money and there are people in the world who do. And he started putting money into development programs in, in the poorest parts of the world. And he recognized the correlation between violent conflict and poverty and said, well, we've got to do something about the violence in order to do anything about the quality of life in the, in the poorest parts of the world. And he started asking it and he's a wellness guy. He's got a, has a kind of a, 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 a fantasy about, about, about wellness. And he said, well, you know, when we study war and peace, we tend to study war. He said, what about studying peace? What are the most peaceful places on the planet? And what are they doing right? How can we emulate the people that are living peacefully? And he started asking around about what, what are the most peaceful countries? Nobody could answer the question. So he said, well, then we'll find out. A friend of his, Clyde McConaughey, ran the, the Economist Intelligence Unit, the premier data analysis organization in the world. And he was having a beer with Clyde, and Clyde said, well, we can do that. <laughs> the EIU can do that. So they teamed up and developed the Global Peace Index to rank the countries of the world based upon their peacefulness, came up with, a, with a 24 indicators, uh, and ended up rating, ranking the countries of the world, not to find out who's the worst. Everybody knows who's the worst. The worst are in the news all the time. Who are the most peaceful countries, and what are they doing right? so that we can study them and learn about the things that enable some countries and societies to live in peace compared with those that don't. And so we now have a data-based indication of who the most peaceful countries are, and we have learned what the qualities and characteristics of those countries are. There's something we call positive peace, where we've identified eight pillars of peace, eight factors, things like good governance and quality education and, and free press, things like that, that enable these societies to live in peace. And then the message to the rest of the world is, you want to live in peace, don't you? And everybody everywhere says, well, yeah, I'd like to live in peace. Well, then here are the things you need to do to live in peace. If you will do these things and do them right, you are more apt to live in peace than not live in peace. Furthermore, this notion that war is good for the economy has been proven to be totally bogus. And in fact, the more peaceful a country is, the more prosperous it is. And peace begets prosperity. It doesn't work out the other way around. The more peaceful a country and a society becomes, the more likely it is to be prosperous. And in order to bring about the kind of social and economic progress we want to see in the world, at the core of that is building a more peaceful world. And that's the message we're trying to get out. And we now have a better idea of what it takes to make that happen and strategies to make that happen. And that, that's all a direct result of Steve Killalay and this initiative that he came up with back in about 2007. And he and I have been partners on this thing from, from the time he started. 
you know, he, he, he wanted to find somebody to partner with in the United States. And one of his friends in Australia said, call Chick Dombach. And he did. And we got together and we've been working together ever since. I saw that this year's Global Case Index was, I think, published in July, which is the 14th. Yep. And uh, from, you know, just skimming through it, because, and I recommend everybody who's interested to just check it out in details, it ranks 163 independent states and territories according to their level of peacefulness, like you said. Um, uh, Iceland remains the most peaceful country in the world, a position it has held, three, uh, it has held since 2008 joined at the top of the index by New Zealand, Austria, Portugal, and Denmark. Afghanistan is the least peaceful country in the world for the second year in a row, followed by Syria, Iraq, South Sudan, and Yemen. All except Yemen have been ranked amongst the five la least peaceful since at least 2015, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, as you mentioned, Jake, of course, it um, explains the economic impact of violence. And then it has a special focus on the newest research report, which is the ecological threat register. Mm -hmm. um, right. To, to kind of keep talking and in, 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 including ecological risks with positive peace and that um, economic coping capacity. Uh, I did see that the results this year show that the level of global peacefulness deteriorated with the average country score falling by 0.34%, which is the ninth deterioration in peacefulness in the last 12 years. Um, so, I mean, 2020, I mean, it's a, it's. <laughs> 2020 yeah. GDI reveals a world. Um, so, wow, it, what this all reminded me of, and again, I recommend everybody to, to read it in more detail because one thing that I'm interested in is, I mean, we speak about Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera. There are countries that have been under occupation. And it's not just civil war, it's a foreign occupation. So it's not just, it's not easy for everybody to keep implementing things that might get them forward. And that is a nuance that I think is very important. So I'm curious, and I don't know whether they take these contexts into account or whether they go into detail into describing why might the situation be like this in Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera, which by the way, I want to say you were against the invasion of the Iraq, which I found out from your book and I thought it was go chick. So, uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's not easy, uh, what I'm trying to say. And I think that once that uh, during the meeting with uh, Mr. Kelly, I think he, and I was then telling him about the idea of dignified resilience, he told me one thing that stuck with me and that was, and of course, when we speak about resilience, the resilience of an individual is not the same as the resilience of the society, which I thought was a great reminder, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Side is the differences of what it would take. Really, a really powerful uh, tool that, that he has created and um, that, that the institute has created and I'm seeing that they're just going forward and you're on the board, I think, of the US. Uh, yes. You mentioned they talk about military expenditure as well. So it's like all sorts of things that I'm thinking and I guess it's just gonna keep evolving like ecological threats or even COVID, you know, keeps being such a part, big part of our lives and kind of even maybe changes our perception of what resilience of societies is made of or what we should think of, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, including the climate change. Well, and, and it all comes together. And one of the things that Steve has paid a lot of attention to and I've learned a lot from is what we call systems. And that's how no one factor stands on its own. Each factor impacts several other factors. And so you can't just address one element, you know, just addressing COVID is certainly important, but there are other factors in, in the way, in, in the way the, these things interact and impact one another. And yet you have to take a systems approach to it and look at the complexity of things and the interaction of various elements in order to more effectively deal with and, and bring about a more peaceful world. Absolutely. So that said, Chick, uh, as we kind of move towards a little bit towards the end and the uh, fun part of our conversation, not that this part was not fun, but this <laughs> was uh, and, and so at the end, I always, my aim is to make my guests approachable and to offer listeners the opportunity to hear them on a slightly more personal level. I ask uh, something that I call five sweet questions, um, which, um, and you can give light answers or more serious, whatever you wish. Um, the first one would be, once the current emergency is over, whatever they might be for you, because we live in different contexts, geographically, et cetera, um, 
any temporary awareness might also disappear. What would you not want to forget from this COVID-19 um, pandemic and quarantine time or just this period in general? Well, I think from, from this period, from, from the COVID period, I think is uh, the, the importance of paying attention to legitimate science and, and medicine. That uh, if, if we do that and not let our biases and prejudices get in the way and simply say, this is a disease, it's a virus that has swept the world as have other viruses in the past, and wishful thinking is not going to wipe it away. It is research and science and the application of research and science and the community coming together, you know, wearing a mask, keeping distance. If we would just do that, the countries that have done that are, are in pretty good shape. So to, to remember that lesson and if, if this should happen again, to remember we are you know, in this together and we solve it together and we do it by paying attention to the science and by behaving in a way that helps mitigate the, the spread of the disease. Surely we can learn that lesson and do better next time. Because certainly, as the scientists say, there surely will be a next time. It's just, there will. It's you just, bet. Absolutely. So, um, next, second question. Which of your personality traits has been the most useful? Not the best trait, but the most useful. <laughs> Uh, I think the most useful is the one that caused you and me to meet. I have a personality trait to trait to reach out and connect with people. Uh, I have some of the, my best friends in the world I met on airplanes. And some people say, you know, you shouldn't talk to the person sitting next to you. And I don't impose myself, but I will just bring up a conversation. If they want to talk, we'll talk. If they don't want to talk. I shut up and when we go on, but I've met some incredibly wonderful people on airplanes and taxi cabs uh, and, and trains and in, in other situations. And I had this incredible network of marvelous people all over the world that are just wonderful friends. And, and that's the, the greatest value in life to me is that and the fact that I've been willing to reach out and open to those relationships is, is I think, probably the, the best thing I have in life. Um, yeah, and I, I, know, I know that, you know, you live that really, what, what you say, and um, I learned from it. So when you have 30 minutes of free time, how do you pass that time check? Tell, well, my favorite. tell us about music. Ah, I was going to ask you about music in your life because I know you love classical music or opera, but in general, um, what do you well, do? Uh, my favorite thing is to listen to good music. I like great classical music, uh, you know, Beethoven and Mahler and Ralph on Williams and people like that. I just, I just get totally enraptured. There's a, a cellist named Jacqueline Dupre who passed away many, many years ago, but she, uh, I got to see her perform when she was in her late teens and was just totally enraptured by her performance. And I still listen to Jacqueline Dupre all the time. Um, so I, I, I enjoy music. And of course, my friend Peter Yarrow and Peter Paul and Mary, I listened to their music and other folk music from the 60s, from back in that day when, when music was, was really meaningful, was, was a part of our movements. I still listen to and, and enjoy that. So that's probably the, if, if I have, when I have some free time, I don't need to be doing anything else. I'll put on some music and, and not do anything else. Just concentrate on the music. Music isn't just background. It's to really focus on and absorb the music and let it become part of my heart and soul. So that, that's what I enjoy doing more than anything else. What skill or craft would you like to master? <laughs> uh, well, at this stage of my life, I'm, there's, there's not a whole lot left that I'm going to be able to master. I enjoy fly fishing because I'm able to get out into the, uh, in, in the, in the, the wilderness and in these, these beautiful streams and cast a fly out there and try to entice a trout to, to take it. And I'm pretty good at it, but I have a long ways to go to get better. So I, I, I would like to get better at my fly fishing. You make amazing coffee yourself and and the other the other absolutely but that, that i've already mastered i've mastered making good coffee so i can't say i need to get better at it i'm already pretty damn good at making coffee i roast my own coffee i carefully select the raw beans and where they come from and i have a whole process that i go through 
and uh, several times a day, I enjoy exquisite cappuccino or espresso. Exquisite, I've tasted it. I know he's speaking the truth. And I do want to add, when he gives a gift of the beautiful homemade coffee that he talks about, he also does an etiquette. Like he prints out a special etiquette in which he even adds a special message. Like I remember that <laughs> for Riata and Mustafa, my husband, and I was just like, this man is amazing. He goes from the beginning, beginning to the end, like full, full <laughs> made with love. It's amazing um, and delicious. But just tells how dedicated he is to what he does, whether it's a hobby or a professional work. So um, I learned from that too, Chick. The last question, are any of your friends completely opposite to you or are most of them similar to you? Well, most of course are fairly similar, at least in, in outlook. You know, I, I tend to assume, most all of us do, we associate with people who, in my case, have a global perspective and appreciate different people in different cultures. But that said, a lot of the people that I'm closest to are very different from me, from very different parts of the world. So many of my best friends are, were born and raised in Africa. Uh, people like Victor still live in Africa, and yet we are incredibly close. So he, he, Victor was born in a displaced persons camp, raised on one meal a day for the first 10 years of his life. That's pretty different from the way I was raised, I dare say. And yet, so we're, we're very different. But we share values, and we're extremely close friends. You, of course, from a, a different part of the world, raised with a, a different faith background. But uh, obviously, we're, we're pretty darn good friends. You don't get any better friends than, than you and me. Uh, so, uh, but, but we come from different backgrounds. Uh, but, but we share, but, but I think in terms of the values, we have similar backgrounds. But, but I am also friends with a number of, of military people, which some people might be surprised. Several graduates of the military academies are very close friends of mine. My next door neighbor, graduated from the Naval Academy, and he's an attorney, and we have very different political philosophies. We're best of friends. I mean, we thoroughly enjoy each other. We have Thanksgiving dinner together, and we're, we're very different, but, but we respect one another and thoroughly enjoy one another. Amazing. Uh, not everybody do, can, can do that, honestly, especially now in the United States when the country is so polarized. So... That's it, Chip. We come towards the end of this um, conversation, which was so beautifully inspiring and just the way that I knew it would be. Uh, because most, whenever we get together, we, we, we talk about um, so many things and I learned so much from you. I think that really I, I, transgenerational solidarity, but also the inspiration that we and the lessons that we can learn from uh, people who have acquired experience or values that we share um, matters. And I didn't mention, I forgot, but uh, of course, Chick has, uh, you know, recently been elected to membership in the Public Diplomacy Council. He's re received numerous awards for his teaching from, from the universities, uh, from students and um, or beyond. Uh, so he's just constantly, I'm glad whenever he posts sometimes or shares something on his Facebook, I'm so glad that, um, Chick, you've been recognized for all amazing uh, work that you've done throughout your career and life. And as always, you've not just been knowledgeable, but inspirational speaker. And I appreciate our friendship and also your service in terms of, you know, building peace and making this place, a planet, a better place for all of us. Uh, and just kind of um, creating this environment of respect. So is there anything that you would like to share with our listeners at the end of uh, our today's conversation? Well, just one thing. I finished my book talking about why I'm confident about the future of humanity and the future of the planet. And I cite a couple of people who are illustrative of the reason that I'm confident about the future of the planet. And you are the central feature of my confidence in the future of the planet. So. Uh, the world is in good hands. You and your generation, I think, are going to do a fabulous job of dealing with these multiple problems that we've left you, but you're going to do a great job of it. I'm confident, still optimistic after all these years, because I believe in humanity and I believe in people like you and I believe in you and your generation. Uh, thank you, Chick. That was very humbling when I read it in the book as well. I just didn't want to brag about it or mention it. Uh, 
he did. I had to mention, I had to bring it up. <laughs> uh, that a lot to me. It's also both a compliment and a sort of responsibility. Uh, so I just will try to keep doing what I do while life becomes unexpected, as you have experienced it so many times in terms of personal challenges or unexpected things that uh, kind of make it uh, need to adapt in a particular circumstance. <laughs> stay uh, kind of on our track in terms of our convictions and values and you know keeping exhausting the limits and doing the rock you know so well, that's good. Uh, thank you so much chick for this wonderful conversation i uh wish you so much health and we are an hour away but because of pandemic we are not seeing each other yeah. but i look forward to getting together as soon as possible and um, to all our listeners as well, uh, I say stay well and um, hold tight to those you love. Uh, talk to you soon with another conversation with inspirational peoples from all around the globe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.